Hello, this is Mitchell Levy, Executive Director of the Open Doors Group College Open Textbooks, and I am very excited to have you here. Um, we have a very exciting uh, panel and, and discussion uh, that we'll have today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the announcement that uh, we have going on in our thought processes. Um, we'll then have Carolyn Vandalip, the CEO of Shared Book Academic Pub, uh, present um, from her perspective on licensing. Uh, we'll have Beth Agriar talk from Bridgepoint Education, as well as Michael Bosey from Flatwold Knowledge. So it should be um, very interesting, very entertaining. We'd like to encourage you, if you have questions along the way, to go into the chat room. We will uh, consolidate those and, and address those sometimes during the event and, and certainly sometimes afterwards. So thank you once again for joining us and uh, let's, uh, let's continue on. The Open Doors Group, as a quick background, our mission is opening doors to education and we lower barriers and you can read uh, what we do, admissions, cost, geography, handicaps. We do a good job of trying our best to uh, open up education and we have a number of initiatives. Um, a lot of you will know collegeopentextbooks.org, um, but we have others as well. In addition to adoptions, we do do consulting um, with organizations on licensing and training materials and go-to-market strategies, mentoring, as well as repositories, and we're doing work with all the vendors that, uh, that you hear uh, that we'll talk today, as well as some others. This is a list of some of our uh, gr groups that are part of the collaborative. Uh, specifically today, it, we've highlighted Academic Pub, Bridgepoint Education, and Flat World Knowledge. Uh, but as you can tell, um, it is a good group of folks, and we'd like to encourage anyone who would be interested uh, to come and, uh, and join us. So today's announcement, we are specifically uh, addressing three points. First is we'd like to talk about the Open Doors Group interpretation of open licensing. Uh, next, we will talk about some of the listing uh, that we have, uh, particularly from Flatwall Knowledge and other content providers that we have on our website, and we'll show you how we're doing that so that those that are looking for open textbooks can easily figure out where they are and how to get them. And third, we want to announce the support of what we're calling um, affordable car, affordable copyright all rights reserved. And so these are the three things we'll address today and the panel will cover uh, as we move forward. So the ODG, COT, we endorse these license types. Um, and, and most of you know all, if you have questions, let us know, but Creative Commons, Public Domain, uh, GNU free documentation, custom licensing, and of course, uh, the, 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 new, uh, the new affordable car um, that, that we're talking about today. So announcement one, let's talk about the interpretation of open. Open means free to improve. Open, from our perspective, does not necessarily mean free because good, consistent, quality, sustainable content has a cost. So we support cost-free for adopters, so desk copies, people who want to use them and improve them. Um, but what we really want to do is we want to support affordability for students and other users. So that's where the affordable car comes in. So why do these policies come about? Um, first of all, we, we, we certainly know and uh, respect a good quality textbook requires a team to put together. Um, we've been working in the OER space for, for a while. Um, we're excited about it, but we have not seen uh, OER and open textbooks cross the chasm yet. Adoptions are slow, and philanthropy is not really a long-term sustainable model. In November, Flatwold Knowledge announced the moving away from the Creative Commons licensing, which is something to think about. And then as we're looking in the marketplace, there are many affordable car textbooks which are now available. And so this is, these are the impetuses that caused us to adopt these policies. 
Um, this is a this is a fun slide. You certainly don't need to read the uh, all the words. Uh, but having a quality textbook requires a team. If you have a textbook that's created without a team, uh, we would argue that either the quality is not fantastic or not great, and it still could be great, but the quality over time needs to be uh, needs to be updated, needs to be sustained, needs to be supported. So here's an example of our announcement number one um, in terms of fees for open licensing. Um, College Open Textbook Open Doors Group, we've, we've created uh, three books in the marketplace. Um, you can take a look at the price points that we have there, you know, 16 to $20 in, in uh, PDF formats, uh, a little bit more for either black and white or color. Um, we, do, we do support free electronic uh, distribution to instructors for review. Uh, in some cases, we'll even pay for bound copies for a review. The, what we'd like to encourage other open textbook creators is to uh, work with us and to license um, their books. And we're using um, Academic Pub, but you could do them in CreateSpace, you know, everything to print, Lulu, and so on. Uh, but we'd be happy to work with you in terms of getting your book uh, open licensed and out in the marketplace. So please feel free to reach out to us. Here's an example of, of, of announcement number two. So if you go to the collegeopentextbooks.org website, we've listed a number of open textbooks which are, uh, that we know of and that are available. And by the way, if there's an open textbook or there is a, uh, a car, a copyrights all right reserved but relatively inexpensive textbook that you think we should list here, please let us know. But if you take a look at this uh, particular uh, book which is circled, this is a flat world knowledge book. And what we've done is we've, we've said that their licensing is custom. And so what flat world has done is come up with a, their own custom licensing scheme. Uh, makes a lot of sense, and we certainly uh, endorse what they're doing, and you can find that on our College Open Textbooks website. In terms of announcement number three, having affordable car books out there, here's an interesting example where you don't need to buy the book all at once. You can buy a or purchase as a student a part of the book, so either you know, part one, part two, part, part three. In some cases, the instructor may make a decision to only use one part of the book, not the entire thing. And the overall cost of the book is, is certainly less expensive than comparable textbooks. Here's another example of, of number three, where we've identified on our website a specific um, textbook which is out there, which is affordable car, which we find as a reasonable price. Once again, we want to continue to increase the books that we have available, both on our website and books that we help support, and of course, the other peer uh, speakers that are with us today help them be more successful in what they're doing. So that, those are my top level announcements. I think the big issue here is focusing on our interpretation of open and our ability to push and announce what's going on in, in the open space and trying to encourage more adoption. I'd now like to welcome Caroline Vanderlip from Academic Pub to Thank talk. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, Caroline. Well, while you were talking, Mitchell, I had the pleasure of actually reviewing some of the chat that's taking place simultaneously. and. Um, I see that somebody thought it would be difficult to actually combine resources from two different textbooks. And um, that's what we do. Um, so Academic Pub is a web-based platform that allows professors at universities around the globe to create custom course materials for use by their students in either uh, DRM protected ebook or physical form. Mostly it's an affordable way for faculty to teach from both copyright cleared as well as OER curated materials across multiple publishers. So let me just, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time just moving the page. Hmm. Um, there we go. Sorry. Um, so no, no, um, no problem. I'm, happy to, I'm happy to move it for you, uh, Carolyn. No, I got uh, it. I got it. I was, just, I was pressing the wrong button. I apologize. 
So um, our premise is that the materials should align exactly to your class and that it should be your choice as a professor as to whether you select those materials from um, OER resources, from copyrighted content, perhaps even from your own um, content that you've written. Um, we also think that it's very, very important that the student be the ultimate decision maker as to whether or not they want to consume that content in either digital or print form. So collectively in those two statements, we're really talking about freedom, the freedom of the faculty to, cho to choose what's in those course materials and for the student to, cho to choose how to consume them. Um, one of the uh, main sources of content that you can select from is the Academic Pub Content Library. Um, this is a library that we've been assembling over the last two years. It currently contains 8 million pieces of both OER and commercial content, all in clean digital files from over 180 publishers across 80 disciplines. So the idea here is you can add your own content, you can add third party materials, you can even add web articles as well as anything in the content library. And we will instantly clear that um, and make sure that there's no liability to the school or to the professor as it relates to um, copyright clearance. Um, by the way, and in keeping with um, the Open Doors standards, um, there's always a free um, ebook for the professor who's actually creating the materials. Um, so, I mean, I think some of this was touched on earlier, but we feel very strongly that. Um, one should not limit oneself to either just what we call commercial or um, copyrighted materials or just to OER materials. Um, the reality is there's very, very solid work in both groups. There's also questionable work in both groups. And um, we are about allowing that professor to make the decision that works both for that professor and his or her students. So you've got the the open and affordable um, resources uh, that are free to use combined with you know, the, the peer reviewed and trusted options um, that commercial publishers often provide. Um, we think it's a really very easy um, equation, which is that instructors want textbooks that are current, um, that where there is no liability for copyright where um, it follows the path that the professor wants to take rather than the textbook author wanted to take. Um, and we know that students are pressing hard for affordable textbooks, that um, many of them want them in a dynamic ebook form um, available on all devices, but many of them don't. Um, our, um, our print version is still selling to about 70% of students through academic pubs. So we know that there's a movement more to um, e-books, but that we're not, we're not there yet. Um, we think the most important is the ability to match um, the content that's available so that ultimately it's a lower cost to the student. Um, uh, this actually is, uh, we didn't do these slides together, but we could have. Um, book that was created on Academic Pub um, by um, uh, Mitchell and team, uh, that history book, um, as you saw, kind of came into the range of what our average is, which is about $30. And when you combine that with, I mean, when you look at that uh, against, you know, the other costs associated with textbooks, you realize that even though um, it's a combination of OER and copyrighted material, the um, the price point is considerably lower than any other option in the marketplace. Um, so I indicated earlier that you can look at the Academic Pub Library, um, all of that content from uh, publishers as diverse as um, Harvard University Press in Columbia and um, you know, 50 to 60 university presses, Elsevier, Springer, et cetera. It's a really, really broad list of content, but we've also got um, a lot of free content, um, and we keep adding it uh, 
as we find it and as we think it's applicable. Included, however, is also the ability to add all different kinds of other content, particularly in rich media. So you can embed a link in our books, both e and print, to a YouTube video. Um, you can add divider pages. You can add images, um, both um, your own as well as third party. And again, we're going to make sure that all of this is packaged and delivered to the student, however the student most desires it. So um, kind of in summary, we represent a wealth of content, both copyrighted and OER. Um, it is cleared, if necessary, in real time. Um, there are unlimited options in terms of where that content is sourced from, as well as what format it's in, in terms of um, putting it into the library. Um, the output is at the student's discretion. The distribution is at the institution's discretion, either directly to the student or through the bookstore. And mostly, um, our motto is to create something that's affordable, relevant, and flexible. And I think I'll turn it over to Beth. Great. Thank you. So we. The slides, I didn't realize the slides, we weren't uh, moving forward. So with the presentation, we will, um, we will make sure that the slides are also available. Um, and what, uh, what we'd like to do, Carolyn, thank you for adding. I think what, you know, there's certainly a lot of chat going on. And uh, we will, why don't we wait to the end and we'll just sort of let everyone uh, respond to some of the questions then. So thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce Beth Agriar, who's a VP Biz Dev and Product Marketing over at Bridgepoint. Beth? Yes, thank you, Mitchell. Um, we are new to this space, so this is, this is uh, going to be, all the chat that's going on is going to be really um, interesting and sort of a revelation to us. But I wanted to spend a little time to talk about a solution that Bridgepoint Education originally created for our sister institutions at Ashford University and the University of the Rockies. Bridgepoint Education is a technology provider to these two universities. And our solution is called FUSE. Um, I'm happy to talk about the origins of that name at another point. But it is uh, a content library, an e-reader, and a platform rolled into one. We've known since the 2007 report, Turn the Page, came out that textbooks have become very expensive and that they often create a barrier for entry to those students who are financially uh, disadvantaged. And I don't think we can show this slide enough. It shows how textbook prices have risen relative to the consumer price index of the past several years. And this was certainly one reason why we developed foods. But there were other reasons as well. And again, I mentioned that we are a technology provider to Ashford University and the University of the Rockies. Both of these universities are primarily online, and they are both non-term institutions. So the logistics of physical textbook distribution just wasn't optimal for them. So it's important to understand that when we talk about foods, we did not migrate from print to digital. We started with digital. These two institutions also serve adult students. The average age is about 35 years old. And therefore, program objectives, course objectives, emphasize both domain knowledge and application of that knowledge. And standard textbooks don't always support this demographic as well as they might. Both of these institutions place a premium on the user experience. And when we started this whole process, it was in 2009, the prevailing digital experience just wasn't very good. And in many cases, it still is not. Both Ashford and Rockies wanted to control textbook costs. And they wanted to break the publisher revision cycle, which, as we know, has become shorter over the past several years. And all of this suggested to us that we'd be better off if we simply made an investment in developing our own library of content 
our own e-reader and platform. And currently, this is a moving target, but currently we have 84 um, e-books or textbooks that encompass most of the general education courses you would get in your first and second year. Our psychology line is deep, as is our early childhood education. So what this represents for students is affordable pricing. And I'm talking about uh, Ashford and Rocky students at this point. But they can get an audio file, a PDF, an EPUB, uh, an app either from the uh, App Store, from Google Play. And, and they can get all of this for less than half of what it would normally cost for a textbook. We think, too, that Thu's addresses the issue of sustainability that we've been talking about. Our authors come from the same talent pool that publishers go to. And our e-books have been peer reviewed by experts from other universities. We also have an editorial staff on, on hand, about 30 people in that group, who guide the manuscript development and review process. So since we've invested this kind of effort in the product, for Ashford and Rockies, we have to ensure that continuous improvement is built into our business model. So to make very clear, uh, Thuz is a browser-based publishing system that is combined with our own in-house textbook publishing effort. Our books are accessible and section vitally friendly. We partner with our instructional design department to make sure that we are implementing the process and standards for universal design. We embed rich media into our books. So we do, when it's appropriate, make them interactive. But, but the, it is, this isn't uh, eye candy. This is really designed to support learning objectives for that particular course with which the book is aligned. And we think that by doing this, we have, we we have been able to engage the student better than otherwise because they see a connection between the book and the course. The next several slides that I'm going to share are some screenshots of, um, of our, our Thu's reader. And um, to start with this first one, one of the benefits that we, or the benefits and functionalities that we like to, to highlight is that we think this is a good reading experience, a good digital reading experience. Thu's content is device agnostic, and it can also be sent in the cloud. So if you're working on your tablet and then you want to go to your computer, all of the notes and highlights that you have made will be preserved. We also made the decision early on that we were not going to apply digital rights management to our ebooks. We found that that is a significant barrier to student adoption. But we do have, uh, within our Thu's platform, uh, configurable security settings. So if people want to add other books that, that are protected, uh, they can do so. Before people were talking about BYOD, we were practicing bring your own device strategy. Our students have lots of tablets and phones, and they want they expect to be able to consume information with those devices. And um, we have really focused uh, over the last two years on native apps. It provides an optimal user experience. And we're certainly aware of HTML5, and we have had debates about what it means to move to that. But so far, our native apps have won the day. You would expect any e-reader to incorporate highlights and notes, and we've even added in extra colors if people want to do that. Some people like to organize their content that way. But at the end of the day, uh, students' notes and highlights can be compiled into a study guide for easy reference. So that's one, that's one way that we take uh, this basic functionality a step further. We ran a pilot uh, last spring, 2012. We had over 200 students in it. And we were working uh, with publishers to, um, to basically Thu's enable, if that's a word, their books onto our platform. We wanted to get a sense of 
different kinds of features that students really valued. And one that they valued was having a very immediate self-assessment built within the book. So it's a pre and a post assessment that allows students to assess their mastery of reading materials. I mean, it's, it's, it's relatively simple. And we're not advocating that we have incorporated adaptive learning into our textbooks. But we do think that this is a baby step in the right direction. Another feature that we tested during this pilot was on collaborative learning. Uh, Thuz promotes peer-to-peer -peer learning by allowing students to share notes and highlights and ask questions of each other. And we thought it, that students would really like it if, regardless of where they were or what school they attended, they share the same book. They could basically link across the country, as it were. And we found out that they really prefer much smaller, more private communities. So we are currently retrofitting this so that students are able to share their thoughts, their notes, their highlights with other students who are in their classroom or who are part of their cohort group. And at this point, I need to turn it over to Flat World Knowledge, I believe. I just want to uh, say that in conclusion, we think that FOOS helps to address concerns about cost, about sustainability, portability, and we also think that it promotes a very good user experience. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk yeah, about thank it. Thank you very you. much. Really, really, uh, really appreciate that. Um, and once again, we've got a we got a, a series of questions, and we will we will certainly ask them uh, after Michael uh, is finished presenting. So, Michael Bozzi, VP of Content and Community at Flat World Knowledge. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Thank you Mitchell. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, VP of Content and Community here at Flat World Knowledge, which means that I'm responsible for all aspects of uh, content, from acquiring, developing, and licensing textbook content, uh, even down to content uh, marketing and inbound marketing. Now, for those of you who don't know Flat World Knowledge, I mean, we've gotten a lot of press, so I think that uh, a lot of folks know who we are and what we do, but uh, the brief version is that we started in 2007 published our first list of 10 business uh, and economics titles in 2009. And we were the first mix of commercial and open. We were trying to wrap a business model around open. And we're kind of the first to do that in the space. Um, and as you probably know, we started off with a free web version. And we had uh, the way that we uh, uh, made money. Sorry, Michael, sorry to interrupt, but people are getting an echo. Um, Okay, hold on. Let me get a headset. Can you? Okay, if you can check the the chat. Okay, hang on one sec. Pam says it's okay now, so go ahead. All right, very good. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so, as I was saying, Flat World Knowledge started in uh, 2007. So we've been around for a few years now. Uh, we're up to about 115 titles. Uh, our version was uh, conceived with a free uh, web version of our textbook, complete book online with an upsell available for formats uh, and supplements. And much like what Caroline said, you know, choice of content and format, really important to us as, as, uh, as well as Academic Pub. Uh, we just believe that empowers instructors to teach a better course. And the market has rewarded us with a doubling growth of, of uh, of adoptions and of users. Um, and now we see, uh, uh, as of uh, fall 2012, we were in uh, more than 4,000 classrooms, uh, a little over 2,500 in, uh, unique institutions, and nearly uh, three quarters of a million students have learned from Plat World Books. So to date, we've been one of the most successful and impactful uh, implementations of, of open. But in, in fall of uh, 2012, and I suppose this was the summer, we, uh, you know, a couple of things changed or, or things that we started to, to detect is one, uh, students got used to digital. And despite all the noise to the contrary of uh, students preferring print, uh, that was not true for us. Uh, uh, the second thing is that our, our free product, the web view, was, was good enough for most students. So what you had was this huge increase in usage, but a decline in uh, per student revenue. 
And we decided early on that you, we had to act fast. And we're a very small business. Uh, revenue dependency is about uh, twice a year given the cycle, and we had to move quickly. And so uh, what Mitchell uh, mentioned earlier is we executed a plan that we call free to fair, uh, which was we removed uh, access to the free reader as of January 1st of this year. And uh, we just we, we had to move forward on this. The signs were, were very clear that this was going to lead to a uh, you know a five year seven year company rather than you know twenty fifty years <laughs> that we wanted. So we had to act pretty quickly on this. So um, and you know we decided that uh, uh, you know we were beholden to our customers more so than we were the uh, uh, the, the open movement or the the purity of the of the movement and the and the license. Uh, you know, we, we were currently serving a number of institutions, and we just we owed it to them to stay in business, con uh, continue to produce uh, good content, and make this business sustainable. So what we did is uh, to execute the plan. Uh, we started in the fall. We had out, uh, a direct outreach uh, to all of our core customers, made hundreds of individual calls, and uh, you know we lost a few customers along the way to about expected levels, which uh, uh, which is good. Most people. Thanked us for the personal calls. Uh, appreciated that uh, the way that we were doing it, um, and and then uh, you know in the transition we uh, you know we were able to to uh, uh, to keep the, the large majority of our paying customers because they you know they the value uh, the uh, textbook they value the quality they value the the company and having us as a great alternative to the high priced. Uh, textbooks offered by the legacy publishers, and of course these folks, um, most of our customers, uh, you know, they're with us because the core book is important, and they understand that students who read their assigned books are in higher grades. But also, you know, to date we've not offered uh, assessment as a part of our package, and so usually those are our, those tend to be our customers. So, uh, and most of the folks who who uh, had a choice to make in, in this transition, the folks who were using Flat world materials for free. Now we're faced with the uh, with the choice. Hey, do I stick with these guys? And you know the books are good. I like them. I've been using them. I chose them for my course, and uh, pay a little bit of money, or do I abandon them? And you know, we, like I said, we lost some of those folks uh, and, and kept uh, the, the the majority of them. Now the uh, 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 basically the the way that this worked was that the uh, Lowest price point, the entry point product is now $19.95 for the complete book, and that's a web version with some study views. And then all of the other formats that we offered uh, stayed about the same price. Uh, our most popular product is the what we call the All Access Pass, which is every single digital format plus all digital supplements for one price, and that's $35. And um, that one is the most ordered. Um, uh, item right now, including more so than the printed books. So for Flat World, uh, the scales have ticked. We sell more digital than we do print now as of fall 2012. So here, the, the question, since this is the uh, purpose of, of this call, is what happened to our license? Uh, Mitchell said that we went to a custom license. We consider our license to be all rights reserved because it is closed now. There is a you know, we put up a paywall, so to, in order to get into our ecosystem, um, you know, this, you, you need to have, uh, you need to pay uh, to be in. But here's how we uh, handled this: we used to have a Creative Commons BYMC SA license, um, and what we did was sought to mimic that license, but within this closed uh, ecosystem. We still want to afford to instructors control of that content, the ability to remix open content, uh, and the ability to share it. But just consider all those things are uh, still possible and we want to make sure that our customers could do it. But all of that is within the ecosystem now. So think of that as its own community, all behind a paywall for, for the students. But the instructors still have all the, the freedoms that they did with um, uh, with the uh, with our former license, Creative Commons license, it's just that it's now uh, a part of a of a uh, an exclusive community. Um, so the the transition to this so far has been uh, has been really successful. I think it's uh, you know our uh, attrition rate was about what we expected, which was good. So uh, 
you know, we had a, a, a so far a very strong uh, adoption uh, uh, trending line for summer and fall 2013 that the sales season we're in right now. Uh, almost all of our authors supported the move. Uh, and most students say, you know, that they're willing to spend the $20 or $35 for a digital textbook. They, you know, much like Beth said, the DRM issue is huge. We don't have any DRM in our, on our formats. If you, you own the format forever, there's no time bombs. And multiple formats are another thing which was surprising to me, but is really important to students when we poll them about why they chose the All Access Pass. They like the ability to, to go uh, from format to format. And one of my favorite things is that uh, there were some uh, folks, students and instructors, who have called it almost free. Because, you know, in, uh, like for instance, in the business realm, in business and economics, and we publish in humanities, social sciences as well. But in business and economics, where uh, the large majority of our titles are, uh, the average price is $165 for these books for a one semester course. So $20 is about as close to free as you can get. So, and the only thing that was regrettable in the, in the transition was just the timing, you know, I mean, I, I feel like we probably lost uh, some customers just because of that, because we had to act fast, roll this out in the fall, and a, and a couple, you know, there were, there were some folks who felt like uh, it was a bait and switch, but, you know, we just tried to explain as best as we could that, hey, this was a, uh, uh, you know, we had to act fast, and, you know, the timing was the only thing that we felt bad about, because uh, we, we were absolutely convinced this was the right thing for the health of the business. All right, so what, are we, uh, what does the future look like at, at Flatworld? Well, we tried to uh, key this to what our customers want. Again, I said, let's focus on what our core uh, folks want. We, uh, we did a listening tour uh, with all of them just to, to make sure that we heard what they wanted. And what you see up on the screen is what they, uh, what they expect. Uh, access, really important, right? We used to be free, so yeah, we got a little less access. But the idea was to take an enough uh, uh, money uh, per student to fund future improvements, right? So what are we going to do with the with your twenty dollars? I guess is the is the question. Um, affordability, uh, obviously, with the twenty dollar price point, uh, we're really committed to that just because you know it's it's uh, it's connected directly to completion rates. And as Beth said, I mean the you know the, the textbook costs have gone up at four times the rate, or nearly four times the rate of the consumer price index. There's got to be a better solution, but it's got to be affordable and it's got to be reachable. Uh, personalization. This has been a tenet of uh, Flat World Knowledge that uh, we hand over as much control of content to uh, our instructor customers as we can. Uh, I think it was Caroline who was saying that uh, it is uh, absolutely. Uh, critical to uh, success to not just run an off-the-shelf uh, uh, sort of automated lecture just using uh, preloaded materials. This is the promise of open and OER is that you can do what you want. It's your classroom. You should have control over uh, what goes on in your own classroom. But the exciting thing is that the, you know, we're going to be able to take uh, now the, the money that we're making uh, uh, in this free to fair switch and start to invest that into the future, uh, a lot of which is going to be the platform, right? In, investing in more content, investing in analytics, right? Uh, being able to give students social cues as to where they are uh, relative to one another, give instructors uh, analytics about page turns and about um, and to add assessments so that uh, um, uh, instructors have a better uh, beat on what, what their students are doing and roll that up to the institutional level and compare that to uh, uh, national averages. All that could be very valuable. And of course, in a uh, platform, this is going to afford us the ability to do some creative pricing, uh, creative packages of sets of content that really puts the institution, the instructor in control. But all of this uh, content with, uh, uh, that's built into a platform that can do all this has to be focused on outcomes, right? The student, student wants choice, choice of format. Uh, they want to be able to have, to, to have their materials be within reach so that they can actually use their core materials. Instructors want more control over the content. They want to view into their students. And of course, the institution, I mean, you know, with, with, uh, with the huge hit in funding that uh, institutions are taking now, sometimes up to 30% reduction in, in, uh, in state and public funding. Uh, I mean, this is an issue right here where, uh, you know, giving students access to their core materials is absolutely critical. It's now actually the financial health of the institution depends on it in a way that it just hasn't 
uh, before. Um, and of course, you know, you got to handle uh, this for all stakeholders. So that's got to work also, not just for students, instructors, institutions. It's got to work for authors. It's got to work for employees. It's got to work for our funding source, which is venture capital. So I mean, we've got to take all that into effect, uh, all, all that into account. And uh, you know, that was uh, uh, that was the impetus behind the, the free to fair plan. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's going well. So I think that's about all I have. So. Uh, I think uh, I'll turn it back to Mitchell. I think we Great, move on thanks. Questions. Thanks, Michael. Sure. Really, really appreciate that. And and you know what's really interesting um, in listening to Academic Pub, Bridgepoint, and Flat World. And by the way, the presenters presented in alphabetical order. Um, what was really interesting is is if you're thinking about it from the context of our licensing announcement, um, it really does. Um, I, I was just sort of thinking about it as as everyone was talking. It really supports what we're talking about and that is open education is is not necessarily about free but it is free to adopt free to use um, free to pull together and I think I think probably the the, the types of questions that I'm hearing um, and by the way I'm hearing some background noise so whoever's got the mic on may want to turn it off until they answer the question um, I think what I'm hearing what's interesting is is sort of the, the questions regarding remixing and the questions regarding sort of utilization of multiple content sources, including a ton of stuff which is free today. You know, so whether or not you're so there are two aspects of the question. Let's do let's start with a copyright one first and then uh, and then we'll add another one which is how do you remix all the stuff that's available today like YouTube and, and uh, Khan Academy and all this other stuff into into courses so let's start with copyright and making sure you get copyright clearances and we'll start with you Caroline on on dealing with copyright clearances on remixing content um, sure so um, uh, we have uh, three different methodologies for doing that. Um, everything that's in the Academic Pub Library, those eight million pieces that I mentioned earlier, have already been cleared for use in a modular or atomized way. So most of that content is already chunked to a chapter level and a significant amount of that content is even chunked to a more granular level, all of which already contains copyright clearance. Um, the second bucket of content is third-party content, your own content, um, other sources that you might have um, a scan of, et cetera. When you upload it into our platform, we have a back-end integration with Copyright Clearance Center, and we will automatically clear that for you um, in real time as you upload it. Um, the third bucket, um, which is the smallest, thankfully, is content that doesn't appear in either of the first two buckets. Um, that still needs clearance and we will do that manually. Um, so the, the point is that um, regardless of where it comes from, um, you know, we will ensure that the end product creates no liability for the institution. Super. Thanks, Caroline. Um, hey, Beth, I don't know if, if, if you want to take that question as is or something slightly different, but how do you deal with copyright type material and bundle and incorporate it into uh, the work that you've been putting together uh, at Bridgeport. Thank you, Mitchell. Well, we have an editorial staff, as I mentioned, and some of the people who are on that staff are permissions editors, so there is a time honor process for doing that. Um, fortunately, you know, it's been a pretty easy thing for us to manage. I can imagine going forward, we might be a little more challenged as a need to add staff, but it's basically done by the editorial staff. Um, in terms of the remixing, I, I saw in the chat that there were some questions about that. We currently don't have that feature, but we are planning to release some authoring tools at the end of our second quarter, which will allow the faculty to upload other kinds of content, their own content. Um, you know, that's what we're primarily looking at, mixing and matching what we have. Um, we would again. We would need to. We would need to see what this does to our process for copyright clearance, because right now all of this is very centralized within our editorial staff, and the kinds of content that we are creating are, in fact, 
ePets books. So um, there's not a whole lot of YouTube videos in them that, that we haven't already pre-cleared. So that's going to be an interesting challenge for us to see how we can help people with remixing. It, yeah, that, that <laughs> it certainly is interesting. And one of what we, we'll definitely come back to that one. Let me let Michael answer the same question, Beth. Um, but but I think I think that's a great. The next question for you guys to prep for is how do we remix not just content but all forms of media which is available on the internet these days? But Michael, let's talk about just copyright clearance and, and other forms of uh, uh, the, the first thing that most academics who are putting together open textbooks are dealing with. Yeah, it's it's pretty simple from from our standpoint. I mean, we try to be a platform and, and hand over that control, but not the services that go along with it. So, in other words, what we do is just have a simple, just like you would with uh, YouTube, for instance, is uh, you have to represent that the content has been cleared, right? So, uh, tons of users put in YouTube videos and things that they've created, um, and we just make sure that they, you know, that they, we make them them uh, represent that, that they have clearance. If we find out they don't, then we just issue a takedown notice and that's about it. So, um, and then we, you know, we work with a, a, a third party vendor to do some of the things like what Caroline uh, was talking about where we get, uh, where we actually clear copyright uh, on third party items. You, you know, you got you, you to gotta be clean about that and do the, do the right thing. So, I mean, we, you know, we do that. Uh, all the time. And the last thing I'll say is we, uh, for any materials that we produce that are the canon versions of any of our titles, uh, we do all the copyright clearance in-house too. So similar staff that, uh, that Beth and Caroline would have. And we have people who, who, uh, who help us with uh, copyright clearance. Uh, given the chat question there, these folks are not uh, lawyers. They don't need to be, uh, uh, but, they, but they have uh, a, a specialized expertise in uh, in uh, in what can be used in, in evaluating and using other sources of content. Nice, thank you, hey, Michael. Why don't you stay with your mic open? Given given that you're the uh, the content guy over at Flat World Knowledge, um, why don't you talk about sort of the vision? And, and this is a, a great question in the chat. Why don't you talk about the vision of in today's world, an academic could have and should have access to anything on the web. Um, so there's some formal stuff and some informal stuff. H how would you deal with that at Flower World Knowledge in terms of pulling together all forms of media, all forms of, of learning and content? Yeah, we do that now. I mean, keep in mind, our, you know, we look at ourselves as a, as a platform plus content company. And of course, when you're still uh, married to print, which we still are, it's still one of our outputs, and of course, uh, e-books, uh, e-pub, will be all, all of those outputs, which I call artifact outputs uh, impede the uh, ability to, to get to something that's, that's uh, 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 where the content that you're using is you can pick from anything, right? So if, you, if we can get everyone into uh, digital uh, and a web view, you could have content that's live and, and updatable on the fly. Uh, you can add anything that you get off the web, provided you have the clearance to, to do so. Because remember, we are a commercial company, so if, if someone puts in uh, a, a piece of material that the third-party copyright owner doesn't want that and tries to sell it, I mean, that's not lawful. Uh, but right now, there's, uh, you know, lots of folks uh, pick up open content. Uh, I have a group in-house in here that, that helps with that, helps advise that, and helps curate that. So someone may start to use our uh, platform to build their own version of a book, um, and we might help them try to find some some additional sources outside or from uh, other books that we have here. There, we have a, uh, quite a few projects in house where uh, folks have mixed and matched content. You know, take a management book and mix it with an organizational behavior book. I mean, all that stuff is possible when you're uh, 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 when you're digital first. Um, and so, you know, it, sky's the limit to a certain extent, right? You need to, to work with someone like Caroline if you're going to do a significant amount of third-party materials um, that are not open, right? You need someone to go and do this. You know, not everyone can be a, a, experts at, uh, uh, at copyright clearance. You need some help with that. But if it's all open material, someone wants to use CCBY or BYSA uh, materials in, in, uh, in our uh, book, 
hey, the third party uh, rights holder has said that's okay. So they can go ahead and do that, mix it into our uh, materials, and they're good to go. And that's a great use Got of it. Open. Michael, thank you. And, and, uh, and Nikki, Nikki says Flatwell has excellent customer service. So it was nice to get, get kudos. Um, so, Beth, why don't, you, um, why don't you tackle the same uh, question? And, and by the way, we did have a question for you in the chat that was, does the highlighting work with apps as well as the web? So you could sort of bundle that into your, into your answer. Okay. Now, so can you repeat the question for me? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, so the question is, in, in today's world where the, the learner, the, the now student, learns everywhere. You know, they learn from YouTube, they, they, they learn from uh, wikis, they, they, they learn from blogs, they, they learn from their friends. Um, how, how is the instructor, how is the faculty member integrating all forms of technology and, and, and how can uh, Bridgepoint help? Well, I don't, I think that part of the, what's, I think that a lot of faculty are not doing that. I think that they're, there tends to be um, a digital divide between some of the students and the faculty. But the way that Bridgepoint can help with that, and again, I like to make the distinction between our material and the course material that's in the LMS, because there really is a line between the two, as, as it turns out. And so for the, uh, we think that the authoring tools that we are creating can help faculty perhaps diversify so, and make use of some of that content, but where our own students are making use of YouTube and, and, and content that's freely available on the web, it's within the, it's within the structure of the LMS or the course. So they are encouraged to bring in information from blogs or things that they want to journal about or uh, YouTube videos. So it's, there's really, when we talk about the textbook and the course at, at, at Asher University, at University of the Rockies, they are in fact two separate environments at this point. And it's within the LMS that you're, that you're capturing a lot of the, a lot of the uh, non-traditional types of content. It's not within our the textbooks. Got it. And, and could you just ask the one, there's one question, does the highlighting work, very specific, does the highlighting work with, within the apps as well as the web? Yes, it works within the app as well. All right, perfect. All right, thank you. Um, Caroline, sort of same, same question for you, if you can. Um, you know, you, you, in, in your talk, you addressed, uh, you know, some elements of this, but how does the changing teaching environment get incorporated into Academic Hub? And by the sure, way, um, the question, there's one, there was one question is, are you in the U.S. only? So that was from um, or, so, uh, so the answer to that one first is we're global. Um, you can access Academic Pub from any browser from any place in the world. And we can deliver the book, um, the ebook, to anybody, any place in the world. Um, it will have copyright clearances, but it will be in US dollars at this point. So what we do find globally is that some of the content is uh, more expensive in the US than it would be in other locations, um, and that sometimes that's a detriment. But going to the rich media question, um, we feel, um, like Beth, we don't see a lot of it yet, um, although there's certainly a lot of conversation about it, and we think it's absolutely um, the next place that um, faculty are going to. We also find that it depends on what discipline they're teaching. So for instance, um, a political science a uh, faculty member uh, will actually turn to video um, much more so than a, um, an English professor. Um, and indeed, we recently had a custom book built on the platform that had over a dozen um, external links into um, speeches and um, press conferences and other political science events that were being housed on YouTube. Um, so we have the ability today to integrate um, web links, um, YouTube links, um, audio, um, images, et cetera. Um, I think the real, um, and before I go there, I think the, um, the, the real question um, comes down to um, do you want to enable the user 
to view all of that content um, offline or should they be online. So um, today we take the position that um, you do need internet access. It does open up a browser window within our ebook that takes you to the destination that the faculty wants you to go to. Um, over time, of course, the question is, you know, should that be streamed from within the device without getting too technical. Um, but the other thing I do want to mention um, is that our solution to making sure that the ebook and the physical book are compatible and comparable is to actually um, include a QR code to any link that the professor has added. So that if you have bought the physical book, the printed book, instead of the ebook, you won't be at a detriment. You'll be able to use any smartphone um, to um, source that video, audio, et cetera. So that's nice. the solution we came up with. No, that's nice. Thanks, Caroline. Well, we're at the, we've got four minutes left. Here's what I thought we should do. Um, why don't we, we'll start with Beth, and why don't we let um, the four of us give a 30 to 60 second wrap up based on what you heard today, what you talked about, what would you like to leave the audience with? And, uh, and then we'll close the session. I, I really, I am honored by the, the, the breadth of uh, background and, and what your companies are doing and what we're doing in the space. And I, I'm very excited to have the, the three of you participate. Um, and so I, I just thought I'd say that. And Beth, could you, uh, you want to do a quick wrap up? Sure, I can do that. Uh, again, I'm really, really glad that we had the opportunity to speak in this forum because in, in many ways we are newcomers. And if I could leave people with, um, with any impression of what we are doing, I would say that um, I think that Thu's addresses concerns about the cost of textbooks. Because this is an ongoing investment that we've made, we believe that we can address the sustainability issue, which is a live issue. We are we think that the we think that content needs to be device agnostic because whether people like it or not, people are going to want to consume information on the device of their choice. So we need to be up to that challenge. And a good user experience is really critical. Um, it certainly is in places where I have been. I also want to uh, acknowledge the work that uh, Caroline and Michael are doing. And I think that there are probably various paths that people can take to uh, reduce the cost of books, to ensure their, sustainab their sustainability and portability. And I think that um, you know, we've presented three viable options here. Super. Thanks, Beth. Hey, why don't we go counterclockwise? Michael, you're next. All right. Thanks, Mitchell. Uh, is my, can you hear me? Or? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you okay, well. Good. Sorry. Uh, sustainability to me is, uh, it directly leads to better quality content. And none of this can happen without quality content, right? So, uh, and, and I appreciate um, what the Open Doors group and, and uh, College Open Textbooks are, are doing, uh, trying to, to sort of widen the view of what open is. Uh, a book alone is not enough. Uh, someone, uh, uh, Nikki and Robert mentioned support. I mean, there's something that you don't get if it's a free product. You can't offer support. You can't offer supplements. You can't offer the things that a publisher might do without having a sustainable business model. And I appreciate that the, that the Open Doors group is trying to really open up the, the, the view of this and say, hey, look, there's many solutions that can come to the table uh, in this vibrant, dynamic, uh, fast-changing market. Um, and it's all got to be pointed at outcomes for students, instructors, the institution. And if you're free, it's hard to play in that. Got it. And that's not to say that uh, there's not some great free materials out there, but, uh, uh, but you know, you, you, you have to, to come up with something that's, uh, it has to be quality. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Agreed. Yeah, sustainability is really the key there, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Caroline, do you want to do a quick wrap-up for us, please? Sure. Um, 30 seconds or less. Um, 
we believe that quality content comes from a lot of different sources. Um, it comes from uh, traditional publishers. It comes from um, uh, open. Uh, it is available in an open environment. It also comes from faculty themselves who have spent a lot of time you know, teaching the subject um, that they have the greatest command of. And we think that um, it's important to be able to mix and match all of those. Um, we also think it's important that the faculty have a way to collaborate with each other um, and to share the work that they're doing. So another major feature of our platform is the ability to allow others to see the compilation that you've done and use that as either a starting point um, or a, a, an end point. Um, so going back to, um, I think all of us are about affordability and all of us are about choice. Um, so I'm going to second what my colleagues um, have already indicated. Thank you, you for know, having I, us participate. Oh, Carolyn, thanks for being here. I, you know, it's funny, three, four years ago when we started talking about open and we were working on college open textbooks, we'd use the word free and, and sort of be slapped around um, uh, it, it, when we said that um, we, we would say, we use the word free and say, well, you know, college open textbooks can't actually always be free if we want to be sustainable. And, and that's when we really got slapped around. And uh, I think today reality is sort of taking hold that it, in order to be sustainable over time, it's impossible to keep things as 100% free. Um, but you know, we, we're, we're interested in open. This was a great announcement. Just want to reiterate, um, if you're interested, take a look at our website or take a look at, we look at this presentation for interpretation of open licensing. I want to thank um, Academic Pub, Carolyn Vandalip, uh, Bridgepoint, Beth Aguiar, and Flatwell Knowledge, Michael Bozzi, and also want to thank uh, the folks hosting Open Education Week. I really appreciate that, and Una Daly for being part of this today. Uh, thanks to the presenters, and I really appreciate uh, this session. You guys all have a great rest of week. Take care now. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you.